in a world full of misery, rage, and insomnia, there's a place you can go to just unwind. All you have to do is take a long walk into the mountains, and just past the black house, the secret garden, you'll find a small cabin. Inside that cabin, you'll find the Hole in the Wall Book Club. So now that the dream catcher's hung and the fire started, we invite you to pull up a chair and join the Losers Club as we explore the world of slurping on people's necks and serious men. This is the part where I say the introduction. Hello and welcome to Hole in the Wall Book Club. I'm Anthony. I'm Alex. And today we are going through, God, I don't even remember the chapters. Eight, we were and, so, nine. eight and nine. Eight and nine. Oh, we were so prepared. <clears throat> I still managed to mess it up. Uh, Salem's Lot. So the first chapter was Ben? Yeah. 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 Ben three. Yeah. And this starts at like, I don't remember what time. It was early morning, uh, like 2 a.m. something, uh, where Ben gets a call from Matt. Right. Yeah. And okay. they have a brief conversation. I don't remember if I don't even remember if we we heard both sides of it. But what we got out of it is basically like, hey, you're gonna have to come see this or you're not gonna believe it. Can you bring a crucifix? <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. Cause this whole section it reads like a, a Koontz novel and that it ends with a lie of the police. <laughs> um but I <sighs> Ben does his thing. He gets up, um, goes down. Ava Ava wakes him up to give him the call because it's a boarding house. And he's like, hey, you're not Catholic, are you? And I believe her husband was. Yeah. And he's like, can I borrow your crucifix? I can't explain why. And she lets him borrow it. Says something about, like, make sure you bring this shit back. It's super important to me. But that whole crucifix thing gets me because it's when they eventually tell the, the lie to the police, like, there's no reason they should get away with it. And I think Stephen King cheated when we get there. So I'm getting ahead of myself. But the crucifix ends up being like a loose end. Mm. Where Ava later on is like, hey, Matt's not Catholic. Why did he want that? It was a thing. Uh, let's see. So it's that he asks, gets the necklace, and then he drives on over to Matt's. Yeah. Uh, and he Matt, notes the total change in atmosphere. Like, it's Matt's freaking out. Pale, yeah, the, the the pale looks all... You know, he looks scared shitless. Mm -hmm. Matt, I think, just straight up tells him from the get-go, right? Or yep. does, yeah. Tells yeah. him that he was... Exactly what happened in the last chapter. He was he was sitting there, couldn't fall asleep, and then hears all this happening. And he had checked him yet? Uh, no one looked at him yet? They had No, he had not checked over him yet. Uh, um, yeah, because that's the main initiation here. They, they go upstairs... They kind of brace themselves, pop the door open, and what's his name? Mike. Mike. Mike Ryers. Me, uh, right, Ryers. Yeah, Who, he's... Uh, he's, We talked a little about this off-cast. I'm going to jump in here. Yeah. Uh, these chapters are kind of short, so we have more room to talk around here. Um, yeah, this chapter was quite short. Mike was the Tommy until this. Like, he was described as like being super you know, happy with where he was in life. Um, the one that really got me is when Matt, the teacher's talking about having him in school, he says that he always liked him because he did above average work with uh, below average intelligence or with average intelligence because he was, he put in the work and he was always willing to ask questions. He was just a genu genuinely likable character. I just want to point that out real quick. Yeah, that's true. If you're likable, Stephen King will come to your home and kill you <laughs> with a bucket. It's because you ruin the evil people image. Right. So you can get to stop you. Right. Uh, but they, uh, yeah, they pop him in the door and... I guess, spoiler alert, Mike's dead. Yeah. And Ben, I think they first go, is he asleep? Da, 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 da. But they go check him. There's no... Uh, Matt checks his breath, wets his finger... They try to find a pulse. Um, pulse in his wrist at first. They, the thing about his arm falling down and wrapping against the floor, and for some reason that really bothers Ben. Mm -hmm. And so he p tries to pick up the arm and keep putting it back, and it appears to be flexible enough to move, which he points out is weird. He was expecting rigor mortis or something at this point. Right. And then um, they check him, the marks on his neck. Oh, right. We forgot to point out, we had heard that there was a mark in the last chapter, um, Matt directly describes it to Ben as a bite mark. 
He's like, yeah, it looked no, like a bite it, mark. It, it, yeah, he thinks it's... That happened right before they came up here. I just wanted to point that out. They Because when they check, they don't find one. And this is where uh, Matt invokes Dracula for the first of numerous times and states that um, when they die, the mark vanishes. Which cleared up... I thought, actually, now that I think of it, I was about to say that cleared up a um, a question we had about Danny. Like, why didn't Danny have marks? Oh, that's true. But it doesn't if it clears up when they die. Because Danny didn't have bite marks in the hospital. That's true, yeah. So. That... <clears throat> Unless he got turned and something happened to him even earlier, and that was sort of like an episode or something. Like, something weird happened in the woods beyond. Mm. I don't know, but yeah. We that, did have that, that reference actually... to sacrifice. Maybe like the first vampire they're making here, Danny, had to be done differently. Because there's the heavy implication that like Ralphie, which come on. How many Stephen King hate a kid named Ralphie? I was got I gotta ask. But I got the implication that Ralphie was sacrificed to for like for Danny's creation. But I could be wrong with that. It kind of feels like that. I think well, something we'll see v- mentioned in the next chapter is it is in tiny circles knowledge that it wasn't just that the marstons were doing weird shit but the people actually thought they were worshiping satan right and so the thing we had mentioned back quite a while ago of how weird it was this lord of flies thing Mm -hmm. looks like that is some i guess this is sort of making ben appear correct because it's making it look like the place is sort of a beacon of evil, so it would draw evil. Right. I, there's no real tangible connection you could actually draw between the Marstons then and vampires there now, except by like people, like by tying them somehow to knowing each other or something, right. or just that evil, that right, kind of right. evil center thing. So they do everything they know how to check. He's dead, but. They put on it. He looks. He looks good at this point, right? No, yeah. Ben actually makes the comment that it's creepy how he looks better than he was described last night. He almost has life to him, even though he's dead. Yep. And they get this whole like, okay, Matt's freaking out. Like, hey, we need to stake him. Like, we gotta stake him, cut off his head. He's gonna rise. This is a vampire now. And Ben's like, but the police, <laughs> like, straight up, like, hold up a sec, bro. Um. At the least, it's going to get you desecration of a corpse. Like, at the least. They're probably going to tack murder on there, too. Because, yeah. And it basically boils down to Ben being like, I don't want to believe you. I'm starting to believe you. But let's test it. Let's put the gears of the machine in motion, I think is what it keeps saying. And we're going to go stake out the grave and make sure he doesn't rise. Cool? Cool. Um, Matt agrees. They call he calls the coroner. He calls the um, Parkins. He calls the the sheriff Parkins, and you know does what you're supposed to do when you find a dead body. And did Ben do something during this bit while Matt was making all the calls? I can't remember. I'm pretty sure it's just a lot of back and forth because Matt just keeps going because like, the calls are actually almost done. Just boom, I called them. Boom, I called right. them. Really, it's a lot of dialogue of Matt going. I'm insane, you don't need to believe me, and Ben going, no, I trust you, we just need to find out this is a fact. And it, it, There's a lot of text of just Matt shouting how insane he thought he was, and Ben trying to console him, basically. Right, right. Um, I think, oh, this is when we get mention um, from Matt that he's friends with the coroner, and the coroner mentioned, like, something weird on the, um, I don't remember what it is, the, same, the stat we pointed out on Danny's chart. Oh, the blood stuff, yeah. Right, and he was like, that's, you know, that's proof Danny's a vampire. It was a child's laugh I heard, Danny turned, Mike, we gotta stake him. That was the logic train, and i be honest, he's right. Oh, yeah. He he's straight up is. right. <laughs> yeah. Like, this could have, this could have fixed a lot of stuff, but, yeah. I, I think it's pretty much that up to the point, does, is it at the end of the chapter where Floyd, that, I it's think. The, it's the end of this, uh. Because Ben goes back home, right? And yes. then that's when... Um, it, yeah, we got like one more thing before there. Yeah. Because that's because we get the coroner and the cop showing up. Oh, yeah. A lot of chit-chat. Yeah. There's a, they're basically because they knew he, he knew the coroner or whatever. There's a lot of like, oh, boy, how'd you see him? They don't seem to in any way suspect foul play, but they're just questioning. Uh, I think when the sheriff gets there, he's a little... Do more in that, doing his job, if you will. Like, yeah. hey, Ben, where were you? Why are you here? Hey, Matt, uh, you sure? And 
obviously he has to tell this story without the vampire stuff. So it's like I, you know, I brought him home. Tells the part of it bringing him home because he looked ill and all that, but then has to state that he, you know, just fell asleep. Whoopsie, found him dead. Yeah, and like they get to the bit where like he explains everything that happens. Like uh, Ben makes the point to Matt, like we don't even say he's dead. Like we say what we did, and we couldn't find a pulse. We're not trained. We'll let them make that decision, which was fine. But it. I just wanted to point that out because Stephen King made a real big point of that. It was like a big part of the discussion, but it didn't seem that important to me, but whatever. They get to the obvious question of like, <sighs> the sheriff turns to Ben. He's like, how did you get into this Mr. Mears? And direct quoting here. And so Ben and Matt started their little song and dance. And none of what they said was precisely a lie but enough was left unsaid to link them together in a tenuous bond of conspiracy. That just means Stephen King couldn't come up with a reasonable explanation. Because I can't. Yeah. <laughs> you just said, and they explained it. What? That felt like cheating. I just had to point that out. That felt like yeah, cheating. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. It's actually a little weird that uh, the vampire-like quality so far in the story are not... If I were to say there's any kind of issue going on at this point in the book it's this kind of feeling that it's like a slasher flick when you're when there's all the evidence in the world all this stuff and the people still act dumb because that's the point right, of the show right it, uh, kind of getting that like i know no one's gonna be inclined to believe vampires exist but someone more than just matt and ben have to at this point be thinking something other than yeah yeah there's a town weird stuff taking kids that's happened before instead of like okay why are there so many bodies like this why is, why is the hospital not thinking this is at least maybe an epidemic or something spreading? Because right. you find this many, you start finding multiple people with the same blood condition. Even if it would, even if it would seem to be something only maybe genetic or something, you'd go, something weird's happening. Yeah. But there's no one reacting to this. We just keep getting more and more vampires and everyone's just like, yeah, he's just dressed weird. Did, really? The third guy dressed weird here? Like, can yeah. someone catch on? I'm... Okay, I'm curious. What what do you think is your threshold? Like, let's say you've been able to witness any of these things that have happened. Like, you, you could have noticed any amount of these people looking the same kind of sick. Like, ex except you can't have seen the vampires coming in the window. Yeah, yeah. At what point are you like, hold up. This might be vampires. I don't know full-blown vampires, but I would be suspicious to the point of being willing to believe something borderline supernatural. I think the second I... Um saw any of these sick people which everyone seems to know like in any kind of proximity like close proximity because the way they're described is extreme like when uh matt picks up mike as the thing his first reaction seeing him is just like not he looks a little rough but like holy crap he looks like he's dead walking mm -hmm. you're seeing someone who looks like that who you've known to up to this very point to be completely fine I guess I you mean, could jump to like he caught ebola so let's put you in let's put you in matt's but shoes at the bar when Mike's going through that conversation, you've already gotten the shock of, oh, you look like trash, not even warmed up. And then you, then he starts draw like, then you start noticing he's sleeping through the days. He's talking about the sun making himself. At what point in that conversation are you like, yo, crucifix? What do you think? Pretty early, specific, especially if you're going to put, like, in the position of Matt, because... Matt's the one who then keeps invoking Dracula. So yeah, he's familiar. Yeah, because he's familiar with it. So I feel like the the personality you're given of Matt, it feels like he should have even noticed. He should have suspected something even faster. Obviously, he makes that one moment when he's showing Mike his bed and like, here you go. He catches the mark on his neck and is like, and gets really terrified. Right. But sleeping during the day, up at night, he can't eat anything because he throws it all up. Like, come on, Matt. Come okay. on. Like you, you, you know this sounds pretty damn familiar. Yeah, you don't no. need to jump immediately to vampire, but you probably shouldn't have been like. Was it the unspeakable illness? Yeah, you probably shouldn't have been like, oh, maybe you have the flu. I'll take you home. That's probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because even if you wanted to be as skeptic as possible, that all those descriptions sound far more extreme than come sleep it off at my house. Yeah, you should have taken him to the hospital. Yeah, it shouldn't have been in the morning. It should have been like we need to go to the doctor now. You look like you're dying. <laughs> Uh, but there's after that, there's a bit more um, where they step out on the lawn and Parkins is basically like, hey, uh, Ben, you're not leaving town, right? We might need you for, was it the coroner's jury? 
I, oh, yeah. It was a weird term, but I assume it was just like to answer questions for the coroner's report is what I took it to mean, basically. Yeah, that's what it seemed like. And it was clearly just like, don't fucking leave town. And um, he points out that... Ben, leave the Marsden house? Oh, <laughs> how would I ever get off again? <laughs> oh, I got to tweet that meme. Oh, I, yeah. Yeah, I made a nice little, Pretty on point. little b- b- ben, uh, ben meme. I'm going to start memeing a bit more. Um but uh, Parkins points out that um, the the screen from the window is on the lawn. And oh, right. Yeah. That little bit of proof that Ben, because this whole time Ben's very much been like, look, I'm not saying you're crazy. Let's be logical. This sounds crazy. And then he sees that screen. And he's like, ha, OK, maybe. <laughs> what? Wait a second. <laughs> Which is interesting because it's almost as if you're experiencing the uh, a parallel in. Ben giving being given that one weird moment to go, wait a second, maybe, it, it, which is exactly paralleled in the next chapter at the end with Susan. Right. When she finds that one, because she has the same reaction as Ben in that chapter of just, nah, 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 you're, you're being a little weird. Ben sees something and just shits herself. Basically. Oh, okay. Okay. Vampires. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I am on board. <laughs> um, they have a little more talk um, and they agree to... We're meeting up. I believe this is also when Ben says he wants to bring Susan to, to do this as well. To the Marston He house. wants to bring her in on it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. He wants, they agree, I think it's the next night, to have him, Susan, and Ben just all go up to the Marston house. And has Matt call off from work. Right. And that is that is pointed out. He take t- t- a chill day. And he make, Matt makes the joke that he hasn't had a day off in like three years. Yeah. It was his last sick day, something like that. Yeah. And then uh, we get Ben going home. A little bit where he chats with Ava and she's like, so why do you want my crucifix? Hey, hey, loose in. Give me that w- w- like crucifix. And oh, yeah. Matt, once Matt, Matt has handled it, he, it actually ends up around his neck and he does not ever take it off as far as these two chapters. Yep. Yep. So Ben goes down for a nap. And then do you want to take him walking out to his car? Yeah, I think he's. He's told Floyd, where is the, oh, that's the beginning of the next year. So F- Floyd, um, he's told that Floyd's, is he told Floyd's there or just someone's there? Uh, I don't Pulls think. up. But she says someone's here to see you. And he heads outside and, or heads to the door. And I think he's like on the porch when he sees it. And they, that's when immediately you see the comment of he's dressed in like a slightly old timier long jacket. I forget the kind of hat, but he has a hat pulled pretty down low. Right. And then he actually keeps his hands in his pockets. Like, and he, There's a moment there where before you know what's going on, Ben's like, and I couldn't understand what I was seeing. My mind rendered it as like a hawking scarecrow. He, like, he couldn't comprehend. I thought it was a cool image. Yeah. And um, believe it actually like just cliff hangs it in that they come to each other. He says, Ben says something. And yeah, then, he's like, what's up, Floyd? Yeah, and then Floyd does the, like, you know, my girl kind of reaction. Yeah, and then I, you're given, like, I think it's going with, to, like, and then Floyd came at him. Yeah, you 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 know a fight's going to happen. Right. Yeah. It's wild. We're getting all Floyd backstory in the background. Like, all, all of its background. Which, yep. um, let's talk about the board. <laughs> because... I just want to say right now, I know we're going to get a bunch of people being like, so you missed some major characters, and we get that. We had to guess on who was going to become a major character or not. Yeah. A um, lot added a lot So of we're basing all our scoring on this board. Um, the one thing we did off cast last time is we made our incredibly specific predictions mm-hmm. that if those are right are worth four points. So we want to state these on air here. Is, uh, yeah. Mine is mine. that Sue gets turned into a vampire sometime during part two. And becomes the major villain of part three. Do you remember what I said? I believe you said that Sue was going to be the one to kill Floyd. Oh, yeah, 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 that's it. Yeah. Whether he ends up dead or a vampire. <clears throat> whether the one yeah, whether, whether she's to defend herself or whatever reason. Yeah, I think she's going to be the one that kills Floyd. Yep. So if we get those right, four points. But it's not yet technically confirmed. But on Floyd, you went vampire. I went dead. So I think you're getting those points. Yeah. Pretty sure you got this. Just a, just a, just a slight inkling now. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of at the point where someone acting exactly like a vampire cannot be a red herring at this point. <laughs> yeah. So congratulations on your two points. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. First points got awarded. The, got the, the mm-hmm. edge. Um, and 
You can check the show notes. I'll put it in this one too, from last episode, this episode, and I'll, I'll have tweeted it. Um, if you want to see the board, <laughs> oh, I think I'm going to put up a Twitter poll so we can like combine the audience responses to give them a, that'd be interesting. Yeah. yeah. See how the audience as a whole does against us. Probably going to beat the shit out of us. <laughs> um, yeah. They don't get incredibly specific predictions though. That's our advantage yeah, yeah. for anyone that's actually going to look up the answers and cheat to sway the average. Exactly. Yeah. That's our combating here. Okay. Then we jump into chapter nine, which is Sue. Um, so she's on her way back from Portland or something like that. Yeah, the she, name went, she sold some out. paintings and bought herself. Made, I think she outfits. made like 80 bucks, which is legit then. And yeah. So she gets home and her mom is sitting there, I think, in her own chair. And she asks um, Susan to sit with her. And we get a little, basically little just, bit of the Carrie Mama feel here. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Basically, reams are for Ben. Mm-hmm. You know, he's uh you know a sissy he's one of those artsy farts one he's of those, not a serious man yeah he's one of those urban guys he's just gonna come by and you essentially implying that she he's just using her and will be gone when he's gone he's not taking her with him despite what she thinks why can't she stay here and have a you know a real person a real guy and a real simple life you know who's a serious that kind of man that yeah. floyd Tibbetts. yeah <clears throat> And they get it gets kind of heated. Um, eventually, the mom stands up and like comes at comes pretty close to her to like emphasize the intensity about you know I'm thinking for you. You don't know what you're doing, and she just smacks her mom in the face. Right, and of course her mom is utterly stunned. She stands up, tells her mom that it's no business of hers to pick what she's who she's going to be with, what she's going to do, all that kind of stuff. And then I think she. Begins to head up the steps. Oh, right. That's right. She states that she's going to move out. Right. And that she's been <clears throat> that, thinking about it for a while. And that her mom's like, you don't have the money. And she's like, I have like 300 in savings and 100 in my more active, the active account. I can totally save up. I can easily find a job over there. Like, when- you get specific. She's like, here's my plan. So you're wrong. <laughs> <clears throat> And then I, I think within that rung, though, she does apologize to her mom. She goes, that right. was horribly awful of me to have done that. But I am leaving and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's when her mom gives her that final, I'm doing this, I'm thinking of you, kind of shout up the stairs. When, does, she, when does her mom talk about the motorcycle accident? Is that oh, that, that is, that, that, that is yeah, that is the main weapon she uses. Right. That, uh, so she her, heard his, the grapevine. Yeah. We know who that means. Yeah. Uh, Mabel Wirtz Which her there. daughter utterly calls out yep. where she got it from. But uh, basically, she mentions that he was driving a bike and his wife died and that he was given a breath- breathalyzer test. But nothing in the article states he was drunk. And that the, the mom's answer was, they don't breathalyze you unless you're drunk. Yup. She was <laughs> like, her mom's like, they gave him breathalyzer. He was driving drunk. She was like, I, was it? What would the test say? Well, a little messy. Come on. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know what? That is a, I think that might be sadly a more common belief than possibly I'd like to believe. Because she, when she calls it out, he, uh, uh, the mom not only makes it sound like that, but then goes so far to imply that the crudeness of the way the article was written was sort of implying it, but also that. The reason why the article didn't state it was because those rich folk always get off the hook. Right. So right. it must have hidden oh, yeah, that he... Sue, Sue hits back with like, well, did he go to jail? Was there a trial? Yeah. She's like, oh, they, they always get off. That's why you didn't hear because he's he's one of those city rich dudes. And if he was a like, serious man, he'd be in jail right now. Which is weird because you know from Ben's perspective that he's it was nowhere near as financially successful as I think he wished to be. Oh, yeah. At no. all. Like one of his books was good and the other two were like, eh. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that was the main attack. She, she re- heads upstairs, does the standard, like, flop on your bed kind of, uh, my mom's a, such a poo-poo head. Yep. Looks around the walls and sees Sierra Club posters. And, like, remember. makes the comment that she remembered when they used to be, like, boy band, or not boy bands, but, like, the rock stars you'd like and stuff like that. And then, like, draws that parallel with Ben and then just kind of gets mad not gets Ben out of Ben, but rather that she's mad that she's made to second guess what she thinks of Ben because of what right. her mom told her. Right. Like her, she can't shake that her mom might be somewhat right. Yeah. She, she makes this <clears throat> mention in that of like, well, what did, what did I expect? 
It's not like he came cellophane wrapped without a past before me. Obviously, he has a past. Oh, I hate this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ugh. Yeah. Why can't he just be local heartthrob Tommy Ross? <laughs> exactly. I know he's the perfect man, but he died in that tragic blood bucket accident. <laughs> so ridiculous. Oh, God. So while she's goofing off, Mom yells up the stairs for her because she has a call. It's um one of the guys at the hospital, McCoy or something. I forget is what his name was. Yeah. Coy, Corey, something like that. And uh, or no, was it him? No, or was it one was of it, the? I think it was Ava. Yeah, I think it was yeah. Ava, yeah, some of the boarding house. I yeah, think. Like, and she tells him that uh, Floyd whooped the shit out of Ben. Yep. He is jacked up. His head got bounced off the car, so he had a concussion. He's he's out. He's in the hospital, bro. And so she finds out where he is, and then like before she, Ava can even really say much more, she hangs up the phone and just books it out the door. Our next scene puts yeah. her at the hospital, and she like begs her way in. They're like. Okay, sure, but don't talk to him. He's unconscious and really should only be talk sleeping. to him if he talks to you. That first. was it. Yeah, and it, he's it's basically let's, let's reenact this. It's like uh, Sue, crucifix. Go talk to go talk to Ben or go talk to Matt. It was, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't much. Yeah, it was basically go talk to Matt. Make sure he talks to the father. Um, he'll tell you everything. And some mushiness. Oh, yeah, I did forget about the make sure he talks to Father Callahan. Because... Because Sue deliberately chooses... the ball. Yeah. Actually, once she gets to Matt's, she, it's just an explicit line. I had the thought to tell him about Father, but didn't. Yep. But, yep. Uh, yeah, uh, does that. Standard, love you, love you. And then he whispers one last mumbled thing, and the doctor's like, what do he say? And she's like, I think he said, lock the windows. Yes. And then that, that, got, that actually creeped me out. I was a little uh, like, oh, okay. And so she heads back out and she finds Ava and Weasel in the waiting room because they were coming to see him as well. Mm -hmm. She tells them that, you know, no one can see them. He's still out, but that she would be back tomorrow and that they should come back tomorrow and visit him then as and well. Ava and Weasel are coupling up. And yeah, we, the scene is actually Weasel. Weasel goes, yeah, we'll totally be here. And then like reaches as far as his arm can reach to put it around her waist and goes, we'll be here, right? And she's like, yeah, we'll be here. The line was something along the lines of, like, he he wrapped his arm all the way around his, her waist. It took him a while to get there, but he did, or something <laughs> yeah, along yeah. those lines. It got me. So they're coupling up. It's kind of cute. I like it. I like it. Uh -huh. Then it um, jumps to her being at Matt's. Right. Stating that she goes there and knocks, but unlike the normal come in, shout, or other noise, he comes to the door and it's just like, uh, who is it? And then when she sees him, he just looks right like a wreck. And he's got the crucifix hanging around his neck. Yeah. Big golden crucifix hanging around his neck. Has her in. They sit down. He makes some coffee. And... Um, and this is this scene. This scene was fairly large, but we're probably gonna go through it pretty quick. Especially since the telling her everything is described as sort of that, and we pick up right at the end of telling. Right. Her. Yeah. I actually really liked this whole scene. I thought it was really well written. I'm I'm really enjoying this whole part now. It's starting to pick up for me. I'm yeah. I'm no, into it. Very, yeah. I'm into it. So she um she's like. They, ban they actually go a bit, a bit back and forth with each other for a bit where she they kind of like choose to see what the other one knows, doesn't know, and then share because she'll go like, do you, the, the, he'll be like, do you know what his book's about? And she'll give her vague amount, but then she'll go, did you know that this happened to him in a bike wreck? And he'll be like, no, I didn't. And they kind of go back and forth on Ben knowledge yeah. for a little bit yeah, there's like before she it gets to the point where she's just like, tell me. And that's when we get the sort of cut to, I mean, now he's told her everything. And she's just like, yeah, that all does sound pretty crazy. I'm not saying you're crazy. I'm thinking it really yeah, hard. Yeah, but but you have to understand you're probably wrong. You may have fallen asleep. You had a bad dream. Just keep constantly trying you to egg him into had a bad dream. Yeah, and Matt's just like, no. No, I was awake. I know. I know he's a vampire. There's nothing you're going to tell me otherwise. It's not going to fly. But during all of this, you keep seeing a moment where she'll talk and he'll go, quiet lean in a bit and then lean back and then they'll keep talking again this happens twice before the third time finally happens and he's like okay there's someone upstairs and she's like i don't hear anything and he's like listen and you hear a creak but then it's a creak described as not just the sound an old house makes but the sound of an old house makes when 
some pressure is somewhere that it normally shouldn't be. So he tells Susan to keep talking like he's still there talking to right. her so he can sneak upstairs. And she, to her credit, like, I, I love this because she's like, okay, he's crazy. But then I did it and I kind of feel like I have to do or I'm going to die. <laughs> So she goes, they actually does have a bit of a dialogue. She's just kind of talking out loud about just life things. And so he's slipping up the steps. And there's a tiny moment on the oh, steps yeah, she I loved mm. where he, he's like, he slips up the steps, like avoiding the fifth floorboard. Whatever. It like points out, like avoiding the creaky bit. And like, I, it felt, it very much brought me into it as a small detail. Cause like, I know walking up my own steps late at night, I'll skip the second one. Cause it creaks like hell. And just, it was that little touch of like, he knows this. It was a good feel. Yeah. I forget how she comes to the idea that basically she ends up she ends up making a parallel in her mind between hell and being alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forget the actual setup for that, but that's like it's right just terror thoughts. It's like yeah, it's it's right next to him, who's t- making the con- who's in his head thinking when he gets to the top, the worst nightmare is a door you know that should be closed but is ajar. Right. And so he's staring at the door and it's freaking him out. And so he slowly walks to the door, grabs the crucifix in his hand. And then slowly cracks the door open, and there is just uh, Mark, Matt, Mike Matt, Ryerson, Mike, Mike. It's all these standard all M names. vamped out. Oh yeah, you describes his teeth. He's got a big grin on his face. You can see where he's been cut by the doctors, but all the stitches are there. But he's just standing there. Mm-hmm. Um, his eyes have like a red ring around them. So apparently, the rules of vampires is you look like shit, then you die, then you look so fuckable. Then you look like shit. Oh, that's right. When he first enters, after that description, he actually tells Matt to look at him. Almost like an right. order. Matt, he almost describes how he just kind of... He says it in the way that makes you want to do it kind of thing. You're getting that passive vampire trick, or trickery kind of thing. Yep. You gotta look at him to my eyes. So he gets kind of mystified a bit, and then he's like, no, no, shouts, sort of like mind breaks it, grabs the crucifix, and sort of holds it up in the guy's face. I rescind my invitation. Yeah, and this is which actually a pretty... question for us. Yeah, which is actually a pretty cool scene, because he's like, he, he immediately puts his hands up like he's like deterred by it, and then like backwards creeps through the window up to the sill right on the edge and then just kind of drops out the window yep. but right before he does it's when he says to the uh to matt well how, how was it worded uh, it was, i believe uh, it was uh you'll sleep like the dead yeah you'll sleep like, like the, the dead, dead teacher, teacher. yeah uh. before he pops out and i believe he even runs to the window and looks down and for like a second sees him but then when he does a double take he's already gone oh and then he starts to feel a pain in his left side, down his arm, while the right hand is still holding the crucifix against his chest. And he very consciously realizes, ah, I'm having a heart attack. <laughs> so he slowly kind of creeps out of the hallway. Um, I believe at this point she's actually come upstairs right. because she heard the racket. Yeah, I believe we get the, like, the last couple bits. No, never mind. And she, <laughs> she kind of pops upstairs and he goes, heart attack, doctor's name. Next to phone number, and she runs to the phone, and we get we get the moment of oh, there's the doctor's name right next to pill pusher. <laughs> yeah. it just I enjoyed that. Calls that calls him, gets him on the phone, says what happens. He immediately tells her to call an ambulance. She calls an ambulance, and the, oh yeah, and then she goes back upstairs to check on him uh, because she's also told to get a. Uh, uh, blanket to put on him, right. not to move him, but to put a blanket on him. So she goes and get, goes into the room that he just left, the ajar door room, to get that blanket. And she knows she looks down on the floor and sees uh, a class ring, picks it up and realizes it's from the school and it's of the initials of Mike. Yeah, and uh, it is just like the uh, screen knocked out. She immediately one eighty. She looks at it and it's just like, yeah, I believe everything now and basically has like an attack in her mind yeah it just completely startles the shit out of her and that's where it ends yeah it's a very straightforward uh, we did chapters. miss one little bit uh that sue and uh matt talked about before that interruption because mm. uh matt briefly discusses uh he mentions like well if uh ben's in the hospital i guess we're gonna have to postpone our plans right and so he's like what plans the meeting striker and possibly Barrow if he was back in town. And we find out that Sue has gone to that store. Oh, right. uh, And we get her impressions of it, which was basically that everyone loved him, but she loved him at first. And then like got the feeling that 
it kind of gradually enhances. At first, it's like he made me uneasy into like he might be condescending into he might actually be a predator. It was this very yeah. slow creep into there how. There was this like, point on the condescending where it's like he seems nice because he knows he won't have to deal with me long or something along those lines. It's like, oh, that's a red flag. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we get that little insert. And I want to point that out there. Yeah. So, um, Oh, and it mentions not seeing Mr. Whatever. And then, of course, that's when Matt's like, I'm not so sure he's not in town. Right. Mr. Boyer, Bor- Breyer, or something like that. Barrow. Barrow. Or Barlow. Yeah, Barlow. Barlow. Yeah. It was good. I'm enjoying this now. It's getting entertaining, yeah. Um, it's definitely getting entertaining. It's very... Um, I'm a little <laughs> surprised, to be honest, at the rate of people being vampires is happening. Mm-hmm. But maybe there's a lot more, like, I think, as you had, like, possibly predicted that the third part might be the return. That's that's what I'm And then if that's the case, then that would explain why you'd want to get this all in before you have that room to do that again. Because it does seem like, for as much of the book is left, we're getting people to vampire it up pretty quickly. Right. Not have, like, a, you know, a handful of people who are already all turned. Yeah. Speaking of vampire people, on the board, uh, let's go ahead and call it for Floyd. I'm giving you the points. I can't imagine he's not unless yep. something weird. Yeah, we'll, we'll change up the scoreboard later if not. So at this point, that's I think that's the only thing we know. It's the only thing awarded. So mm, yeah, two I points so. to zero at current. I've always found that I do best when I start from behind because then I realize I don't need to care <laughs> and it doesn't hurt as much when I lose. Well, the, the Floyd will double dip if I end up being right about Susan killing him. I know. know. Yeah. Which I, I feel like is... If my logic that justified Floyd being a vampire because that would be the thing bent used against him to bend him towards this route, mm-hmm. then... Because obviously, we have no evidence to think this, but I think it's pretty obvious that the vampires probably want Ben dead. If they're as clever as you would think they are, they probably know he's been snooping too much. Right. And so obviously the next logical step in that kind of arc is that then the final Susan confrontation. And I feel like she's got to stake him or something. Yep. Like, yep. why, Susan? Uh... Did that... So where do we vote on, on Anne, Susan's mom? I can't see which color is which there. One of us voted vampire, one voted dead. Oh, should... Where, which one's that? Uh, oh, up right up, up, up at an row. angle. The vampire is you. Okay. I put dead. After seeing that conversation, I feel more confident in that decision between her and her mom. They're set up very adversarial. And Floyd was the chip picked one by her. I can see that. No. Nope. There's some legitimacy. So I might pick up that. some points back yeah, there. You, yeah, you might. Yeah. So I guess going next episode, um, we're going to be doing just one chapter. Chapter 10. 10. Yeah. The lot three? Yeah. The lot three. And this one. While only being one chapter is another lot, but a lot chapter inside of this fiasco now. And it's also long. Like, it's, frankly, when we make these decisions, we normally don't look at page count. We look at the audible, like how long the narration for each yeah. chapter is. Because it's just a quick visual way. And it's like an hour and a half where most of these were like 30 to 40. We also suspect we're going to have a lot to say. Because like we said, I think when our last time we dealt with a lot, we were like, we'll try to be quick. And there's just so much packed into it that oh, we yeah. thought that this one especially in the heat of the moment kind of stuff. We definitely want to do this by itself. So this one may have been a bit short, but these two chapters were really to the point. Mm -hmm. You're getting, you're being finally confirmed in the it's begun kind of state. So this was very matter of fact. And it was all the pieces. It was good. Yeah. It was a lot of the length of this came from like really interesting writing. That is not very quick to summarize, but very good to read. Right. Yeah, exactly. Not a huge amount happened, but, it was well written and important things happened. Right. Um, do you have any? We're not officially drafting till the end of the book, and you get first pick here because you tricked me into taking first pick when you knew who I would take anyway. But do you have any front runners in your stand survival team that we pick at the end? See, I took the Susan of the last book, right? Oh, I mean, I are you going to double Susan? Susan? I mean, if she goes vampire, that's some power. Uh, I probably say it's. I'm either I'm either on the team Susan and I'm going to take the other one. Or I'll soft pick her because actually who I would be interested in yet, we still haven't gotten a lot of info on certain other people. Gotcha. There's, we've, been, we've been so, f- at least for the past several times, we've been very Ben-focused in his domain. Right. I kind of want to see who the hell and the other play. Us, neither of us picking Ben. Yeah. I assume. <laughs> no. Yeah. So I'm, I'm Weasel Craig's on my short list just because he'd be good to pick up like... Who? Weasel Craig. Oh, yeah. He just keeps up that. morale. Yeah. It's hard to be sad when Weasel Craig's around. Yeah, and he, he does stuff. He seems to know how to do constructive things. So. Yeah. 
So we've been kind of flirting with the idea of starting a Patreon and doing some bonus episode stuff where we oh, yeah. watch like Stephen King movies and such. Give us a tweet. Let us know what you think about that. Anything else? No. Nah, I'm pretty... <laughs> okay, fuck this podcast. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess until next time, I am losing the serious man competition and you've read the book. Hole in the Wall Book Club is a part of the Ice and Year Productions Network and produced and edited by Anthony Sheets. The music in this episode is Supernatural Radio by Kevin McLeod. There'll be a link to his license and website in the show notes. If you want to get a hold of us, tweet us at Ice and Year or send an email to iceandyear at gmail.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to tell a friend or leave us a review on your podcatcher of choice. Word of mouth and five-star reviews really help us get out in front of more people and let us expand and do more things. More information on the show can be found on iceandyear.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time.